And uh, now I'd like to welcome our, let's see, I believe our final speaker of the day, actually. So thank you very much, um, Dennis. And uh, he's going to talk to us about supercurrent rectification, Lipschitz invariant, cortex squeezing, and magnetochiral effects in synthetic Rashba superconductors in, in 35 plus 10. So good luck. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much for a very kind introduction and also for the invitation. And uh, I am a theoretical physicist and I am from the University of Regensburg. And as you see on the screen, I would like to talk about a few things and I hope you will enjoy it and you will learn something what you didn't know. So the first thing I want to say a few things about the, in the introduction, looking back to the history and tell you something which uh, still now was not said on that workshop. Uh, then I would like to say a little bit about the phenomenology and maybe tell you finally what is a Lipschitz invariant because people start to use this term, but uh, discussing with many people, I realized that it's not truly clear what is it. And then I will focus maybe on the signs and, and, and some papers which, uh, which were already mentioned by others. And I will say something about the Josephson effect in non-central symmetric Josephson junctions and about something which we have a new in the Regensburg, and this is the anisotropic vortex squeezing in, in synthetic Rajba superconductors. So as was already said uh, on that workshop, uh, maybe the story started uh, two years ago, and basically there were very fascinating experiments, either there in, in quasi to the stacks of the superconductors, we already saw the dog of Professor Ono. Uh, then there was the similar effect was observed in the Josephson junctions by the Regensburg group, uh, led by Professor Strunk and uh, Dr. Nicola Paradiso. Then there is also the, uh, the experiment, which is also done in the Josephson junctions, but now instead of Rajba superconductors, uh, the authors use a uh, Dirac semi-metals in, in connection with superconductivity. And as I learned today, and also a few years ago, or a few days ago, there are many other experiments uh, regarding, uh, regarding the similar effect. And please apologize that I don't create a cartoon and put you here, but we already just saw, let's say, the talk of the of the rule from the uh, uh, Ali group and, and, and things like that. And very often it's come like that, that people say that there were experiment and then soon after that, there appears a theory and I'm just putting here also the archive submission dates. And basically you see that, that most of the work was basically published uh, almost a year ago there are those three famous papers. Uh, all of them are now published also in the journals. This is in the, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, this is a, a in PRL. This is in the New Journal of Physics. And as well, there are many others work, uh, which I am just listing here. And again, I am not creating the proper, proper uh, let's say, the cartoon of your work. But also, I want to emphasize that in our experimental works, there is a substantial part of the theory. So I would say that uh, along with uh, those guys, also our experimental papers contain the significant part of the theory. And since we will have a, we already had, and since we will have a very good speakers already uh, on that workshop, let me just make some very poor man explanation of the superconducting diode effect. I will not go into the details. And basically the physics and transport properties of the Rajba superconductors can be understood from this, let's say, cartoon-like approach. So I have a Hamiltonian, which a part of the standard dispersion contains some uh, asymmetric Rajba interaction. And that's my Fermi surface is split. And it means I broke the space inversion symmetry. And if I'm now applying the magnetic field due to the Zeeman coupling, then I am shifting the, the Fermi co contours and I am breaking the time reversal symmetry. And if I'm now taking into account the interaction of the, of the uh, electrons, and I am assuming that the spin orbit coupling energy is the most dominant energy scales compared to the superconducting gap, Zeeman energy, exchange energy, then I would have a pairing only inside of the, of the, of the circles. And what comes out, and we will see it, and I will try to convince you on the phenomenological level, that what we will see is that the original S-wave pairing start to be position dependent, and we will get that it's modulated by this phase factor. And standardly, it's called a, as a helical superconductivity. 
And I will try to convince you that this is the example of the second order phase transitions of the Lifshitz type. And I will try to explain what is that. And if you now take this into account and you take this simple cartoon, you already see that on the level of the Fermi energy, the, the Fermi surface look, look differently, whether the current is, or whether the magnetic field is aligned with the electric current or whether it's a perpendicular to that. And then basically, if you take the mirror symmetry of this Fermi surface, you clearly see that in one situation, the, the Fermi surface and then you would also expect that the superconducting pairing are symmetric with respect to the transport direction. So in that case, the supercurrent in one direction is expected to be the same as the supercurrent in the other direction. However, in this situation, the mirror symmetry with respect to the transport direction is clearly broken. And then you can naively guess that, okay, in one direction compared to other direction, there can be different current response. And this everything will be true, uh, but we also are breaking here a little bit of collective memory. And this is the say, historical part, which I want to remedy in my talk. And what I want to do, I want to tell you that uh, there are some maybe forgotten or maybe not well-known works of the Victor Edelstein. And Victor Edelstein published at the end of the 80s and at the beginning of the 90s, uh, I would say very interesting papers. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of Professor Edelstein. So anyone, if the audience if has a photo, please don't hesitate and send me the photo to this email address. Or if you would have still other questions that this can be also used as a contact to me. But I want to say what, let's say in, in this paper, which I consider as a very remarkable was done by the Edelstein. And Edelstein consider exactly the same situation if, of many authors nowadays. So we consider that I have a quasi 2D superconductor, which has some polar axis because of the Rajbar interaction in his case. And he applied the transverse magnetic field, which can go either in this direction or in the opposite direction. And he computed what is the supercurrent in such situation as a function of, of the applied magnetic field. And if you read the abstract of his paper, you will exactly see that he's predicting the existence of the anomalous effect when the magnetic field basically decide what is the magnitude of the critical current depending on this product. Yeah? So this is the direction. C is not the speed of light, it's, it's a direction of the, of the polar crystal. Then there is a magnetic field and there is the scalar product with, with the current. So I am recommending to really look into that paper because basically what he did he derived the explicit formula for the supercurrent. So this is the supercurrent as a function of the in-plane magnetic field. And he's getting that there is some component which is independent of the magnetic field. It's just dictated by standard superconductivity. But here then you are getting the something, okay, this is some function which contains the temperature and Fermi momentum and things like that. But this interesting thing is here. So basically you are seeing that there is a direction of the current and then you are seeing that there is some vector product between the polarity and the magnetic field. And in one case, this quantity can be positive, but in other case can be negative. And then we would have a supercurrent rectification in principle. Yes, so this is odd in, in B and J. And if you look into the, his paper, you will see that these coefficients include inside the Rajba spin orbit coupling, Zeeman term, temperature, and many other quantities. Basically, what I want to say is that the supercurrent diode effect, at least theoretically, is with us since 1995. And uh, just for the people who are here from the theory and maybe didn't know about that, so what he did is basically what everyone is doing nowadays. So we take the unperturbed Hamiltonian, which has just the kinetic part and the Rajma spin orbit interaction. Then he considered the Zeeman coupling. And then he applied also the magnetic field uh, or the vector potential because he wants to compute the supercurrent and you need to make uh, some proper variational derivative with respect to the vector potential. And if he applied the magnetic field, he is basically seeing that what happens here is that one contour is moved to the right, another to the left. So we will get a center of mass momentum. And then he just take the Hamiltonian which has the standard form. And he also assumed that the superconducting pairing should be Q-dependent. And then basically he just take the self-consistent equation, iterated several times according to the Gorkov, and he arrived into the three energy, 
which depends on the psi superconducting order parameter, magnetic field, and vector potential. And if you look how his free energy look like, so he discovered that there is the standard Landau term, which we know it should always be there. Then there is a standard Ginzburg term, which would not be surprised to be there. And there is a standard magnetic term because we are considering magnetic interactions. And now comes a new term, which he call, I, I, I don't remember now whether he said it's Lifshitz in variant. It's, it's highly probable, yes. And this term has exactly the form which I was telling you here. So if you're looking into this expression, this D is the covariant uh, derivative, so including the vector potential. So it's a gauge invariant, uh, covariant derivative. So basically, this is proportionally the standard way to the supercurrent. And then you are having this uh, product of the magnetic field and the, and the polar vector. And this is this constant K, which depends on, on many fundamental parameters in the Hamiltonian, like the temperature, chemical potential, Rajba spin orbit interaction, and, and the G factor. Yeah, and then basically using this, he derived the formula for the supercurrent. And we see the supercurrent rectification or the supercurrent diode. Okay, so let me tell you what is this Lipschitz invariant. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there is a very nice cartoon which uh, we cannot read, but maybe those people who will watch the video online then can stop and, and read it. So let me tell you a few things about the phenomenology and its power, especially with the phase transition and the superconductivity. And the three main guys uh, are here. So it's Landau, Lifshitz, and, and Ginsburg. So Landau was maybe not the first who asked that question, but he was definitely the first who answered the question, asked the question that what should happen that if I have some highly symmetric state, let's say as wave superconductor or some crystal with a few big lattice, and I am now changing some external parameters, let's say pressure, temperature, or magnetic field, what should happen is that uh, this state is going to some low symmetric state, which I'm just schematically plotting like that. And basically he answered that question. And what he did, he take his famous functional, he expanded it as a function of the order parameter. And then what he did, he takes some trial order parameter, which has the lower symmetry in his case. So that was the order parameter, which has the highest symmetry. He assumed he knows it. For example, in this case of particularly dead group, it can look as, 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 a, as a function just of the x square, y square, and then square. And then he admixed some term which are yeah. pizza, would you like? Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, might be a little spicy, but not for you. Yeah, okay. Perfect. And then if you plug it into the function now and you expand it as a function of alpha, you will get the different terms. Lando concluded that if this term is non-zero or this term is lower than zero, then what happens is that the system will go to that and he will lower the symmetry. And okay, there is some group condition which I don't want to uh, discuss here, and it's called the Landau condition. This was the story of the Landau, and now comes on the stage of Lifshitz, and Lifshitz basically repeated Landau calculations, but he was assuming a different thing. So he asked himself that what would happen if I will allow that the low symmetric state will change in a space. So it would not be the constant, but let's say its phase can vary in a space, and he would have a very, on the scales of large space modulations. Basically, he did the same thing as Landau did. So we take the functional, now he changed different ansatz, assuming that these alphas can change with the position. He plug in and he take the first term, which was non-zero. And he realized that it has a form of the alpha times the derivative of alpha and some coefficients k. He just split it to the symmetric and asymmetric parts, which is basically just the identity. And now he gives the argument that what matters is not the phi, but the integral of the phi, because this is defining the energy. This is just the energy functional, which should be integrated. And you just clearly see that this term is not contributing because this is the total divergence. So what matters here is this term. And if this term happens, then it means system can make some another phase transition. And this is the phase transition of the Lifshitz type because minimizing this functional will gives you different ginsburg landa equation. So that's what is the Lifshitz invariance and how he did it. And again, I just formalized it into the terms of some group theory uh, arguments that basically people just looking at to the group 
they are able to tell you whether the given group has a Lifshitz invariant or doesn't have a Lifshitz invariant. Yeah, so once more, this is the physics. You need to minimize this function now. And you are just seeing that since you are making some anti-symmetric combination, you need at least two different alphas. You need alpha one and alpha two to get something non-zero. So for example, you can take the superconducting or the parameters and split it to the real part and to the imaginary part. And if you are doing that, then basically you can express these Lifshitz invariants now the case as a plus of two complex conjugated terms. And this is basically the transition of the Lifshitz type that now the order parameters can start to change in space and start to acquire uh, phase dependence like that. So this is this Lifshitz invariant and this is this term. And this is the physical meaning what happens that the order parameter in space is not homogeneous but on the large length scales, it can slightly modify and give you a different phase transition picture. Okay, so just to make a quick summary. So Landau made his theory in 1947, uh, 37. Lifshitz contributed in 1940, basically not postulating, but deriving that there is a possibility to have other term. And then comes the, the uh, uh, Ginzburg, who basically added the kinetic energy to the term and make the make the things uh, time dependent or basically allowed for the time dependence of, of, of those problems. So this is the let's say the end of my of my uh, summary or let's say of my pedagogical part when I want to tell you some history which is often not known or it's ignored or I don't know maybe both. Okay, so very good. Uh, literature or very good sources uh, to read about that. So the non-central symmetric superconductors are with us, let's say from 1994, when it was realized in, in this heavy uh, heavy fermion uh, compound. And then the people motivated uh, by work of the leaf sheets and many others, they tried the different point groups, they tried different uh, orbital pairings, they tried the different spin orbit couplings, they tried the different G factors, this is the most relevant, uh, let's say, references, which I would like to share with the potentially interested uh, people. And uh, yes, so just to show some slides, so people nowadays know which group allow which kind of the leaf in variant. For example, till now the situation which I was discussed was connected with the group C for more, but there are many other possibilities and people can find it and can basically inspect whether the structure they are investigating is allowing such term and how it will modify the phase transitions. Okay, so what this uh, Lipschitz invariant is doing, let me just once more summarize it. And as I was telling you, so uh, this is the extended Ginzburg lambda functional. Now it contains the new term. And this new term brings into the game a new length scale, so a part of the coherence length, which is uh, responsible for the proximity type of the fx and tells us how the, how the order parameters changes its magnitude, which means the absolute value. Then there is a magnetic penetration depth, which tells us how the order parameter responds to the external magnetic field. Then there is a new length scale, which I'm calling the Lifshitz length scale. And this is the length scale, which tell us over which distances the phase of the order parameter is changing, not the magnitude, but the phase. And I'm just showing it, let's say, uh, cartographically, like changing some, some complex number. Uh, so this is some, some color sketch of that. Okay, and then you can just ask, so maybe you know the famous movie from the Monty Python, what has the Romans ever done for us? And then you can ask what has the Lifshitz invariant ever done for us? You will be surprised, but Lifshitz invariant is with us, let's say, from 50s. So the first thing which is remarkable is that there are these chiral magnets, and this is the uh, free energy functional for the chiral magnets proposed by Jaloshinsky and Moria. And if you're looking for this Jaloshinsky Moria term for the magnetization in the continuum limit, this is nothing else as the Lifshitz invariant, which I just saw but now in the three-dimensional case. Yeah, I was considering one-dimensional complex case with one alpha and second alpha. This is the three-dimensional realization. The second thing I'm saying to you, for example, those who are famous or who, who know something about the liquid crystals, in the liquid crystals, there is famous Frank Austin free energy functional for the 
for the n vector, which is the director of the of the of the uh, liquid phase. And again, if you are looking in this term and you expand this term, yeah, you will just see that you are getting a product of the Q and again some term which is proportional to the scalar product of the order parameters with the with the uh, curl of the order parameter, which is again the Lipschitz invariant. And as I just said, since 1994, I think there is also with us with the supercurrent biodiversity. Okay, still maybe last historical comment. If you look for this famous paper from the Alexander Bushdin, he's analyzing the current phase relation in the superconductor, which exactly can be composed of some polar medium. And he investigated that on the term of the free energy functional, which is exactly the form of the Lipschitz invariance. And he just, by plain calculation, came that the manifestation of the Lipschitz invariant is in this anomalous phi zero shift, which I'm just calling for the purpose of this presentation as the, as the Bushdin effect. So that was, from my side, let's say the history and pedagogical part. And now let me move to the science and let me tell something about the non-central symmetric superconductors and say something about the experiment and the theory. So let me start. So firstly, I would like to talk about the superconducting diode effect in the Josephson junctions and about some related magnetochiral phenomena. And I am just telling uh, main things because tomorrow uh, on the same forum, uh, there will be speaking my colleague, Dr. Nicola Paradiso. So I think he can say uh, much more details which are maybe more uh, useful for experimentalists. I will just say the important things from the point of view of the, of the, of the theory. So my experimental colleagues from the Regensburg pioneered in a way that they are able to measure very precisely the quantity, which is called the Josephson inductance or the vortex inductance. And the idea is that you are placing your system to some RCL resonator and by adjusting the parameters, you are able to tune it into the resonance. And out of that, you are somehow able to read the uh, inductance. So that's how I am understanding the thing. But why the inductance is important. So what kind of physical information we can learn from that? So by the, from the definition of the inductance, we know that it's a ratio between the voltage and the rate of change of the current. And assume I know this inductance. So I will show you that knowing that will allow me to to reconstruct another important physical quantity, namely the current phase relation. So assume there is some current phase relation, but I don't know its form. But if I'm just plugging it, then I am just by plain mathematics getting this expression. And if I'm now using the second Josephson equation, we saw it in the previous talk, we are seeing that the ratio of those two quantities is equal to the fundamental constant, which is this magnetic flux divided by two pi, two p. And then basically we are getting out of that the differential equation, which tell us how the phase is changing as a function of the current. And we see it's directly proportional to the inductance. So assume you know this inductance from the measurement. If you will integrate it, you will get phase as a function of the current. So it means you will get phase current relation. And if you will invert it, you will get the current phase relation. So to get the information about the current phase relation can be known if you will know the inductance. And this is also the fantastic point how the theory can start to talk with the experiment because current phase relation we are normally able to compute. And then just going in the reverse way, we are able to compute the theoretically what will be the Josephson inductance. And that's exactly what was done. So my experimental colleagues they did a measurement. So they considered this array of many junctions and they measured the inductance of the junctions. And you see the inductance as a function of the bias current. So they are measuring, they are really changing the current. And then they are applying the uh, magnetic field and they are able to change the angle of the applied magnetic field. And you see the uh, different uh, angles between the current and, and, the, and the magnetic field. And what you are seeing is that the inductance at the beginning, which is perfectly symmetric with respect to the current bias with the in-plane magnetic field, which is not along the current, starts to be asymmetric. And the maximal asymmetry is achieved when the magnetic field is perpendicular to the current direction. So if you look into the, those data, 
and we saw it also in the previous talk, we can start to talk about some non-reciprocity and to the linear order around the zero bias, we see that the effect is described by this uh, inductance magnet to chiral anisotropy coefficient because we are clearly seeing the, the traces of, of, of this physics. But if you would like to go far away, we need to add also the higher order uh, corrections. So basically taking the data, you can extract and you can, uh, you can uh, go to those numbers. And if you plot them, you are getting this magnetochiral coefficient, which can be, which is basically here written in a little bit more complicated way as a function of the angle. And what you are seeing are the experimental data and the theory which, which describe them. And you see that under certain conditions, we are able very satisfactorily explain the experimental data. So let me say you a few words about the theory. So the theory was done mainly by uh, Dr. Andreas Costa, uh, Paolo Eduardo Faria Jr. Uh, in the group of Professor Jaroslav Fabian, in, including myself. And what we consider was exactly this supercurrent uh, or this slab of the, of the superconductor, which we consider as a three-dimensional slab because we want to model it, uh, taking into account many specific things. So we take some Hamiltonian, which has the standard kinetic term, since we are having here also the, the, uh, the uh, barriers. So we take some barrier potential. Uh, there is this rush by interaction. There is the in-plane magnetic field, which couples to the, to the electron spins. And we also need some confinement because the system is described as a, as a 3D, 3D system. And we want to get the, all the parameters or those all the parameters as they are having in the experiment. Yeah? So these barriers we need because the junctions are not fully transparent, but they are very highly transparent. So for those reasons, we included some, some barrier heights. We would like to have the Fermi energy and, the, and this potential such that we are having the same amount of the transverse mode. And also the Rajba was estimated really for the, for the junctions. So we take the junction and we take the uh, really Poisson solver for that and you self-consistently solve the profile of the wave function in, 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 in such uh, indium uh, uh, arsenide uh, quantum well. And based on that, we are able to estimate the size of the, of the Rajba interaction. And all that was placed into the quant and by adjusting one parameter, which was this, this confining potential, we are able to perfectly adjust to the experimental data. But I don't want to go into the more details. Uh, just as a teasing, there are some interesting things. For example, there is a crossover. If you look for the critical current and you take the difference of the critical current in one direction and another direction, you are seeing that at some magnetic field, it's, it's basically quench and, and, and start to die or even maybe change the, change the sign. And all that can be re reproduced if, if the model is a little bit uh, extended, but I cannot say anything yet because uh, the work is still not fully finished. Also, there are some special features in the experiment, for example, this kink. And if you would like to model it, that also the model with uh, uh, Andreas uh, generalized and proposed. And surprisingly, it's very simple. He's able to capture also, also these this things. So in the last point, uh, I still hope that I have a few minutes. Let me introduce the things which I consider as the most important and uh, something which uh, is also related to the synthetic Rajba superconductors. So what we consider roughly the same outer list of the people, so was in the same way that now we don't consider the junction, but we consider this meander, which is created from this synthetic Rajba uh, superconductor, which contains of the aluminum on top and the indium anzernite based quantum well. So we are having a two deck, which has this, this, this sample. And then you can drive a current and you can again measure the inductance. And I will try to show you that in that case, you can read from the inductance some another interesting quantity. So if you have the inductance or if you have a vortices, because we will also now apply the perpendicular magnetic field, we will create the vortices. And if you drive a current, then the vortices are responding to the current and they are starting to move. And the mo motion of those vortices is basically the, uh, is subjected to the following three forces. So there is a Lorentz force, which is due to the driving current. And in that case, it, it passes to the vortex to move to the, uh, to, to that side with the, with the vortex velocity uh, uh, VV. 
But since the vortex is moving in the condensate, he is dissipating and the dissipation is proportional to the velocity. But the, in most of the case, there are some imperfection and impurities and those vortices are pinned in some, in some pin potential, which we just model as a basically linear harmonic oscillator. And this K for the uh, very sharp pinning centers are basically proportional to the curvature of the, of the wave function itself. And if you now consider the things that the magnetic field is assigned to the vortex and the magnetic field is moving with you, then you start to produce the electromotive force. And if you compute this electromotive force and you take the ratio of the, of the intensity of the electromotive force with respect to the current, you basically, by solving this plugging, you come to the following expression, which tells you that the resistivity is purely inductive. And this is the formula for the uh, vortex inductance of the, of the single vortex. So in the experiment, there are many vortices. Yeah, so if you take a sheet, there are many vortices in that. So the sheet inductance is basically proportional to the number of the vortices times the vortex inductance of, of the thing. So my experimental colleagues were able to measure that, again, by the same techniques as I showed you. So they apply the current, they apply the magnetic field, they were able to change the in-plane magnetic field, and they were able to measure the vortex inductances, and this is the result. So in this first plot, first plot, I just want to tell you that in any of these plots, that one of the magnetic field was zero. Okay? So in that case, there was not any in-plane magnetic field. And what you see here, that if I'm rising the magnetic field by Z, then basically I should get that there's a linear increase in the inductance, and that's exactly what we are seeing here. Yeah? So the inductance is, is increasing linearly. What we are seeing in this graph is the temperature dependence, which is very important because now we keep the magnetic field fixed. And if you are rising the temperature, then the wave function or the condensate wave function is diminishing, is going down because temperature is against the superconductivity, which also means that the curvature will go down which means that the inductance will go up and that's what we are seeing. So here we are seeing the rise of the inductance. And this is the manifestation of the fact, as I say, it's related with the phase function. And in this case, there are not any vortices, just the in-plane magnetic field. So what we are measuring is just the kinetic inductance of the, of the, of the, of the uh, condensate. Just the mind, here we are having something on the scale of the nano Henry. However, those guys are on the, on the scale of the micro Henry. So basically we see that the most of the inductance is carried by the vortices. So we don't need to carry about the, about the uh, condensate uh, uh, kinetic inductance itself. So what is the expectation you would have now? So if I will turn on both magnetic fields, then I would say, okay, I am more devastating to the wave function. It starts to be more and more diminished because magnetic fields are against the superconductivity. So in that case, I would naively expect that the inductance should go up because I am killing the K. And what was surprising for us was that it's exactly opposite. So now you see the data for the fixed out of plane magnetic field of 10 millitesla at this temperature. And now we are changing the in plane magnetic field once it's a perpendicular to the driving current and once it's a parallel to the driving current. And what we are seeing that first thing, inductance is not shooting up as was expected, it's going down. And it's even going down anisotropically. Yeah? So we are seeing this anisotropical increase of the vortex inductance is subsistence. And this is the polar plot that you are seeing how is the inductance along the current and perpendicular to the current, which corresponds to those data. So we are seeing that there is a change of the curvature. This change is contraintuitive and it's even anisotropic. So how to explain that? And the way how I was able to do it after discussion with my colleagues was, I can only do the phenomenology. That's why I'm saying the power of phenomenology is that there is some free energy. So, okay, you take it, you derive the equation, then you try to solve that for this particular geometry. And this equation is very ugly in a sense. First of all, it's nonlinear as always, but even it is uh, lacking the rotational symmetry eh? because now we are having also the in-plane and out-of-plane field. So basically, uh, there is some work you need to do with that. And this work was done. So we proposed the ansatz. 
such that we are having some vortex. And this vortex in principle can have a two different axes. So it's not necessarily circularly symmetric uh, vortex. And some function which depends on some higher powers of, of the coordinates. And in that case, the psi square, which would be exactly given like that. And we were computing those coefficients kx and ky. I can tell you that, okay, we were able to convert the problem to some algebraical problem, but we, will, we, we got uh, some equation of the six, six, six power. So they are not just unique solutions. So depending where is your magnetic field, you should pick up the different solutions. So what I did was I am just showing you the solutions for the small magnetic field. And here is what we are seeing if you are plotting the solutions which we get from the numerics. So what we are seeing here is the situation when there is not any inclined magnetic field and we are seeing beautifully nice circular symmetric vortex. So what is done in this situation is that there is a current there is the perpendicular magnetic field, and this is the profile of the vortex. So I'm showing this C square as a function of, of the position X and Y. And we are seeing that the vortex is that elliptic. And we are seeing that, okay, in this case, the curvature is very, very high, which means the data should be very, very low if you are taking this uh, formula. If you are going to the opposite situation, when the in-plane magnetic field is a part parallel to the current, so the vortex is again oscillating in this direction. But you are seeing that the ellipse is completely opposite. And in this direction, the, the curvature is much smaller, yeah, which is also seen in this graph. And here we are having a higher or larger inductive responses. Yeah, so more details about the data and the theory you can find in this paper, which is uh, submitted now as under review. So I'm almost at the end. So what I'm telling you here that we are seeing that there is an enhanced vortex spinning in the non central symmetric Rajba superconductors. So, this is the something different as the superconducting the iode effect. But this is also something very remarkable. And the second thing is that this anisotropic vortex squeezing in Rajba superconductors seems to be a simple consequence of the presence of the Lifshitz invariant, which is the same thing which allows you to explain the superconducting diode effect. So again, inductance is able to unhide some interesting property of the superconducting condensate itself. And that's my conclusion for today. So I hope that I show you some things and now you have a grasp of what the Lifshitz invariants or what are the Lifshitz invariants and you somehow understand what was the Lifshitz motivation. And now you see that how it's related with some spatial phase modulations in the space. Then I was trying to convince you that from kinetic and the vortex inductance, if you are able to get those quantities experimentally, you can read out important properties of the superconducting condensate itself. From the kinetic inductance, you can guess the current phase relation. From the vortex inductance, you could get the information about the profile of the wave functions around the pin centers, which is something I would say very remarkable. Yeah, then I was very shortly present you our theory of, uh, about the supercurrent diode effect in the in this uh, Josephson uh, junctions. And last point, which I consider as a, something very interesting, was this anisotropic vortex squeezing in the synthetic Rajba superconductors, which we think is a direct manifestation of the Lifshitz invariants of the synthetic Rajba superconductor. So, as a conclusion, I would like to thank my experimental colleagues from the University of Regensburg, from the group of Professor Christoph Strunk. Dr. Nicola Paradiso, Dr. Lawrence Fuchs, and uh, Christian Baumgartner, and also my theory collaborators from the, from the group of the Professor Jaroslav Fabian, Dr. Andras Costa, and Dr. Paolo Eduardo Faria Jr. And thank you very much for your attention, and I am looking for the questions. So, oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis. And are there questions? We, went a little over time in the talk, so we only have a few minutes for questions, but you know, we're have the discussion afterwards, so there's still yes. room. So feel free people uh, to, you know, post in the chat or uh, simply raise hand. Um, maybe again, it was a nice dense talk, but ah, here we go. Ilya, uh, please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. So I, I, I didn't uh, exactly understand the system for this uh, th that allowed this vortex squeezing. Uh, but uh, so could you explain exactly the like the requirements for, for for observing this effect? Is it 
um, you know, for example, if I if I have a bulk inversion breaking superconductor, could it have such an effect or superconductivity yeah, at an interface? And yeah, and could you remind me the system where you observe this? The system consists of the aluminum, which is a superconductor. This aluminum is on top of the indium and uh, indium arsenide quantum low. So basically, you create some two deck, which is proximitized by superconductor. And this two deck is by contra uh, co uh, construction having a Rajba interaction. This is this uh, this is this simple system which I was trying to show that I am having this uh, uh, so something like that. Yeah. So aluminium two deck uh, with Rajba, and you are having a vortices because you apply the external magnetic field, and due to the interaction, you are having also the pinning center. So now you start to drive the current. And then you are applying the different magnetic field, yeah, either from that. So you have a freedom to choose the magnetic field, whether it's perpendicular or along the current. And you just measure the inductive response of that. This is this is the system. So the theory which I present presented should work for arbitrary uh, Rajba superconductor. You just need to help split Fermi space and basically shift of the of the Fermi of Fermi contours. So what is this comb structure? I mean, can I, uh, like in this picture on the right, so I mean, can I just think of a uniform sheet of aluminum on a Rajba 2 deck or this comb structure is essential? Uh, this structure is just showing you it's a schematic vision that you are having the pinning centers when, when the vortices are pinned to the impurity. Uh, Dennis, no, I think he meant comb as in the, the picture on the right. The... Uh, that's, that was just the meander that you are having a long system because you need the many vortices to get the inductance because sheet inductance is proportional to the number of the vortices which you have. So you need to have a long system such that you accumulate the signal such that you can see the something on the range of the micro, uh, Henry. Yes, that was only for the purposes to have a good signal. So this so... is a technical stuff and you need it longer and you need to put it to some Yes, a rotator, so it cannot be linearly long. So basically, they 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 created this snake picture just to have it a compact small. Uh, sorry, sorry. So it, why can you not have simply a long sample? You can have it, but I think they would not be able to put them into their uh, gadget in which they are measuring the inductance. I see, I see, I see. That was only the way that they need to have some something which as the proper idea, the proper area, mm. are able to put it into some cavity and measure something. I Maybe see. I can okay. answer since I did the, the experiment. So the, the inductance of the vortices as the kinetic inductance is a per square, is a sheet inductance. So you want the largest number of square. That's why you want a big length if you want also defined width. And uh, we have uh, uh, 3,000 square, which the total length of our uh, junction is uh, eight centimeters. Since your fridge is typically four millimeter, you need to have this uh, zigzag meander, but it's pretty a uh, technical thing. You want just a uh, lots of squares to have a decent signal. Okay, but, uh, but apart from those technical issues, the, the, um, the phenomena is, just a property of a, of a of a superconductor at an interface with the uh you know for example yeah this like rajba two deg it should i one could consider at any such uh uh interface this uh vortex squeezing yes if you are able to generate vortices and pinning and pin them then yes it's it's general okay okay yeah thank you Thanks, Ilya. That was a great question. Um, do we have more questions? Uh, let's see. Anything in the chat so far? And uh, officially, you know, we can say we're now in the discussion time, but uh, I think it's okay if we continue a little bit. I mean, it is discussion anyways. So again, if people have uh, have questions, uh, feel free to feel free to ask. Yeah, the, uh, I, Dennis, I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, well, along these lines, so um, my, uh, 
a, a colleague, Britton Plord at Syracuse, has shown that you can get asymmetric vortex motion in an appropriately designed device. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, you know, in the context of this, or, you know, what you're describing here, uh, if that has an interesting, that might, that might be an interesting interplay with these, these sorts of effects that you're describing um, with spin, when adding things like these in-plane magnetic fields. Uh, but, but, but because by structuring the superconducting device in an appropriate way, uh, the vortices feel different pinning, pinning forces in different directions. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is the question? So, oh, oh uh, I guess maybe, maybe there's not a specific question. I was wondering if it had been considered whether uh, the interplay of these um, uh, uh, of these in-plane field effects, which I hadn't appreciated before, um, on, on, on asymmetric uh, pinning structures, if there, if there is any. So what was just considered was assumptions that the in-plane magnetic fields couples via Zeeman coupling to the electron spin. That's yeah. the other equivalency which was, which was used. So, and we assume just everything is homogeneous. So of course, if you will start to consider things that they can change in the space, uh -huh. The magnetic field is larger and the vortices can start to interact, then we would expect the departure from, from what I was saying, because I was assuming, uh, for example, that the vortices are almost not interacting. A large magnetic field will bring them together. Yeah. Also, the things I consider that each vortex carries just one flux quantum, yeah, but you can have vortex, anti vortex merging, or, or things like that, or you can have uh, these giant vortices which they are, which they are having. So all that was not taking into, into account. And I see that there can be something interesting from, from, from that perspective. And that's a good point. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Vala. Good question. Uh, again, further questions? Maybe I'll ask a, a simple one and a short one. So Dennis, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that talk, uh, especially the first half, let's say. That was very, uh, very enlightening and entertaining. Um, small question then. Uh, so the enhanced vortex pinning in the, uh, the non-center symmetric Rashba systems. So again, I guess I had asked Dido a sort of similar thing. There are a lot of non-center symmetric superconductors out there, many with uh, heavy spin orbit coupling, for example, that could make this effect. Should I be looking for this actually in all of them, or is there, a, is it, will I only see it in really the low dimensionality, even if it, you know, I have type two bulk, non-center symmetric, heavy spin orbit coupled materials, but would I see this unless I go, or only if I go into thin limit? So maybe you could just elaborate. Yes, so, so the experiment was done in really film, which is relatively thin, so you can consider it like a quasi 2D system. Also, the theory was done exactly using this assumption. Mm. You will have a 3D superconductor, which would be non-central symmetric. You still would have this polar axis, but what then happens is that the vortices are like a chimneys, you know, so they are not just the point object. So basically then they start to dance a little bit more complicated uh, due to the, so if you have the current now, the vortices will deform in a little bit, uh, um, not so simple way as it, as it is done in this two-dimensional case. Okay, so in that case, the many details of the pinning start to be very important. Mm -hmm. okay? Case basically, the pinning for us is just the delta function. Okay? I that, see. So in that case, you can have also the pinning which would be along the z direction, which was ignored here, and then you can have some much more complicated dynamic. And I'm not sure. Uh, what the experiment will tell us, and neither I am not able to simply generalize the theory which I presented for such a thing. Cool. Uh, that actually sounds then like a fun area to do some exploratory experiments. <laughs> Sometimes it's the most fun if it's not an obvious, you know, answer. Good. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, are there more questions? Otherwise, we can move on to uh, let's say the uh, discussion. Section. Yeah. Going once, going twice. Okay. Then, in that case, I think um, let's thank again our speaker uh, and all the speakers of the day. Everyone did a, a great job, and I think it's been a great workshop so far. So, thanks everybody very much for your contributions.
And uh, the floor, I think I'm going to turn over to Vala, uh, who's going to write, if, if I'm remembering. Uh, 